Household debt in the United States rose to $17.5 trillion in 2023, an all-time high, due mostly to mortgages, credit cards, and the root of all evil, student loans. Shakespeare wrote, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3. But borrowing money is what people do. It's how we can afford to buy big ticket items, start businesses, or get ourselves ready for a career by shelling out for a higher education. And there's one specific market force in particular that plays a key role in whether or not we take those big leaps. I guess you could say the whole thing is pretty interesting. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall Macroeconomics. When you borrow large amounts of money, it's not as simple as when your buddy spots you five bucks for a slice of pizza, which you might Venmo right back to them the next day. When you take out large formal loans, in addition to paying back the money you borrowed, you'll have to pay back interest. Simply put, interest is the cost of the service of borrowing money in the first place. Interest isn't a set amount, like a price tag on a t-shirt, a sandwich, or a, a new toy for my cat that he's guaranteed to completely ignore. Instead, it's a percentage of what you borrowed in the first place, called an interest rate. And it'll haunt you like the ghost of your dead father, the king of Denmark, until you pay it all off. Say you want to build an adult-sized ball pit in your backyard. Now, the first step is going to be deciding whether this is a ball pit big enough for adults, or if it has balls the size of adults. Or maybe both. But step two is going to be rolling on over to the bank for a loan. Basically, if a bank lends you $10,000 and they charge you a 5% interest rate on that loan, which is a great deal, by the way, you should jump on that or into that, you'll need to pay back that 10 grand and another $500 on top of it because $500 is 5% of $10,000. You also might have noticed interest accumulating in your savings account. That's because when you deposit money into a savings account, it doesn't just sit there all safe and sound in some vault never to be touched until you come back for it. The bank actually borrows it from you in order to lend it out again to other households and firms. The bank pays you interest in return for borrowing your cash, though usually less than they lend it out for, so the bank can make some money off of your money too. Same goes when you lend your money to corporations or governments by buying bonds. That corporation or government will eventually pay you back the original amount plus interest. You could even invest in certificates of deposits or CDs. These are not an ancient music format beloved by my generation, but an agreement to lend a bank a minimum amount of money over a minimum number of years. They earn more interest over that time period than you'd see in a regular old savings account, but with a penalty for early withdrawal. The longer your money stays in a savings account and the higher amount you lent out or invested in the first place, the more you'll make in interest. Likewise, the longer you carry a balance on your bank-issued credit card and the higher that balance is, the more you'll have to pay in interest. In the case of interest, time is very much money. This is known officially as the time value of money. It's the idea that the value of your money right now is higher than the same amount of money later on. This is partially because inflation can decrease purchasing power, but also because of how much you could be making in interest. The future value of your money is usually greater than its value now, thanks to interest. But that's only if you lend your money to the bank or buy up some stocks or bonds. If you stuff it in your mattress or bury it in the backyard or hide it in an ancient temple setting booby traps for renegade archeologists, it won't be worth as much because you'll be missing out on all that interest. Now, we're not financial advisors here at Study Hall, so we're not here to tell you precisely what to do with your money or what a good interest rate might be for your borrowing and lending needs. What we can answer, though, is how interest rates will affect household and firm consumption. It's that macroeconomic perspective we're all about. In general, lower interest rates encourage purchases of big ticket items or things that you'd need to borrow lots of money for, while higher interest rates might give you pause. If you're saving up to break ground on your adult-sized ball pit, or, you know, buy a home or whatever, you might have your down payment all ready to go in your savings account. But if interest rates are sky high, you might end up paying back almost double the original loan. In that case, you'll probably want to keep saving with your own interest rate racking up or trickling in, depending on the account. Uh, comment below if you're interested in study hall personal finance. However, higher interest rates are great for lenders. They prefer to lend money at a higher rate because then they get a higher return via interest. 
Higher interest rates can also incentivize households to keep their money in the banks or invest some of those in stocks, bonds, or CDs. But saving money usually means you aren't spending money, at least in the short term, which can lead to an economic slowdown. If nobody's purchasing, firms will slow production, start laying off workers, and then nobody has money to spend. To fight a stalling economy, the Federal Reserve will drop interest rates in order to encourage borrowing and kickstart the economy. But uh, more on the Fed in a later episode. And this isn't just true for households. Remember, businesses borrow money too, to invest in important things like more factories, new technologies, and to generally keep on expanding and businessing. If interest rates are high, they're going to be less inclined to borrow the money necessary for these big ticket purchases, foregoing the chance to expand production and the economy in general. Meanwhile, lower interest rates encourage businesses to take the plunge and spend big, which turns up the heat on the economy as a whole. So it doesn't matter if you're borrowing money from a bank to build that adult-sized ball pit for personal use or to start your adult-sized ball pit business empire. You're gonna wanna pay pretty close attention to interest rates. The supply of savings and investments and the demand for loans interact in their own market, the loanable funds market. And unlike other markets where there's a distinction between the buyers and the producers, in the loanable funds market, everyone participates in borrowing and lending. So everyone is both a demander and a supplier. In the loanable funds market, demand comes from firms wanting funds to expand or entrepreneurs who are ready to open that adult size ball pit to the paying, playing public. Plus households looking to borrow some funds to say, go to college or grad school or build their own private backyard ball pit. Because let's face it, public ball pits give me the ick. Supply mainly comes from household savings, bank lending, and foreign funds. If you take all of these savings and subtract all of their borrowing for ball pits or business degrees or whatever floats your boat or rolls your balls, then you have net loanable funds. National and state governments are also suppliers of loanable funds, but that's a whole thing and we'll get, we'll get to it later. Now that we know who is borrowing, everyone, and who is lending, everyone, we could put it on a graph. We know that borrowers, whether they're households or firms, will be more willing to take out loans at lower interest rates. So the relationship between borrowers and the interest rate is negative, and we see our demand curve sloping downwards. But the relationship between supply of loans and the real interest rate is positive. When interest rates are higher, savers are more likely to keep their money loaned out to banks, reeling in that extra interest. This means this supply curve, like other supply curves, slopes upward. In the middle, where a supply of loanable funds meets the demand, we have equilibrium, where the loanable funds market sets the equilibrium interest rate. But as supply and demand shift, so will that equilibrium. Let's say that thanks to some new TV show that's based on an original sci-fi series from the 1960s, everyone in the country was suddenly obsessed with space exploration. The big companies have all started competing with each other to make the first space vacation experience possible. Technology advances rapidly, as if in direct violation of the Prime Directive, a spaceship from the future came back in time and spurred early development of interstellar space drive technology. Other firms rush to the banks to get their loans for their own space exploration business, and a new space race is born. These external shocks of technology and consumer tastes and preferences cause a huge increase in the demand for loans, shifting the demand curve in the loanable funds market to the right. Behold, as the equilibrium interest rate boldly goes where it hadn't gone before. Meanwhile, if consumers go out and spend all of their savings on very flattering spacesuits, the supply of loanable funds will decrease and shift the supply curve to the left, meaning there is less for companies to borrow and making it less likely that some of us will ever get to look down on our itty bitty blue planet like the aliens do. But because the increased demand for loans to fund a new space venture is going to raise interest rates, consumers might want to start thinking twice about dropping all their cash now when they could be making and saving more for their eventual spaceship ticket. Generally, in situations like this, the loanable funds market does a pretty good job of keeping itself in balance through supply and demand. But like we mentioned, there are times when the government steps in to raise or lower interest rates to heat or cool the economy as a whole. But whatever the invisible hand of the market or the not so invisible hand of the government does, it creates a new equilibrium where savings equals investment, ensuring a balance between the two in the national economy. Whether or not it's a good idea to go into debt for your entrepreneurial ball pit dreams or even, hear me out, a plan to put a ball pit on the moon is up to you. To borrow or not to borrow, that is the question. As both borrowers and as lenders we be, we're all personally invested in what's going on with interest rates. 
But the happenings of the loanable funds market don't just influence your own personal spending versus savings choices. They also mean big things for the national economy as a whole. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like. Uh, comment if you would invest in an adult-sized ball pit and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.